All right. So um, let's see where to start. So to do the study, I um, first had to buy the kit uh, and get it shipped to me. Uh, and there's a lag time for that. And then I uh, got here and I, you know, went out and t drew blood on people. I was uh, trained, I trained in phlebotomy. I was trying to go to PA school a while back and phlebotomy was the fastest way to a medical um, degree or certification. And so I did that. So I happened to have phlebotomy skills and then um, got the kit, drew some blood and, uh, wrote up a questionnaire along the way to get, provide a little bit more contextual information. And that's how I knew who had a cold or flu since the first of the year and ages and stuff like that. Um, I call it a semi-random sample because it was, you know, like friends and family and friends of friends. Um, and I didn't know any of the homeless people that I drew off of, but, um, for the most part, I, there was like at, at the most one degree of separation between me and people tested. Um, and I live in Portland. Most of the people came from the Portland area. Um, there are a few people I knew from uh, the Corvallis, Albany area who were also tested. Um, let's see here. So I made the decision to test for IgG antibodies and not IgM, mainly because to test for IgM, you have to run, use up a second plate um, and or you would have to only test 20 people and uh, because you can only test for IgG or IgM at one time. So one well for each. Uh, and in order to maximize the number of people I could test. I just went for IgG. And since I knew most of the people in the study, you know, I was able to communicate with them and say, say, have you been sick? You know, no. And I knew that, you know, not for most people in the study had not been sick recently. The only person who was sick at the time of the study was um, most likely not sick with COVID-19, highly unlikely, and um, which turned out to be, in fact, the case. Um, so decided to go with IgG to get this kind of historical view on uh, infection. Uh, the GenScript kit was uh, designed to target spike protein. Um, I talked to them about this and they showed me some specificity data that indicates that um, the spike protein is much more specific. It's the much more dominant um, epitope targeted by our immune system. Then at the alternative that you'll see out there is nucleocapsid, which is um, another common viral protein. And that's, uh, the issue with nucleocapsid is that there seems to be more cross reactivity from other um, coronavirus uh, immune responses or antibodies that are uh, specific to other coronaviruses or were at least originally developed in response to other coronaviruses. Um, so that's how I decided on the IgG and the specific target. Um, so then I just displayed the um, optical density readings from the plate. Uh, the, I had an issue with the standard. It was just to concentrate it to um, get a, a concentration. So kind of went with the qualitative view. And then interestingly, I had independently decided to call the top four OD values or the subjects with the top four OD values to be positive. And uh, then I talked to GenScript and I said, hey, 
I'm trying to interpret these results. Um, can you tell me what you think? And they actually independently confirm the same four to be positive. Uh, so that made me feel a lot better about it. Um, although the we have one strong positive and then the other three, I think, should be retested to really verify uh, whether they're positive or not. Um, and, I, you know, I just haven't had the time or I don't have the resources to fully dial in the assay. Uh, so two of our positives were actually their friends. They had contact with each other when one of them was sick. Um, the one who was sick first was number 32 and potentially passed it to 30, number 35. Uh, the, you know, one thing I left out of the report because um, it would have been speculative and the timeline did not match up really um, with what is known as the uh, emergence of COVID-19. And that's the uh, number 32 had a Chinese exchange student at their house who is living in the States from September to, um, the, to January 8th, actually. But since the exchange student was in the U.S. for so long and there were other people that were around the exchange student who didn't get sick, I didn't and I'd never tested the exchange student and, you know, nobody, he was, or the exchange student was never um, diagnosed as far as I know, at least in the U.S. with COVID-19. So I just thought it would be far too speculative to include that information in the report. But it is um, kind of an interesting anecdote that's worth considering. Uh, and then, you know, I tested the homeless people who were super nice. The, one, the first homeless person I tested was really nice, really smart. It was a really interesting uh, experience. You know, he was very lucid and uh, I had walked up and I said, I, I just started with, hey, how's it going? What do you guys know about COVID-19? And I was just kind of trying to feel it out and see if they would, you know, communicate with me or whatnot. And they, you know, knew a lot, actually. They were pretty aware what was going on. And they were also, you know, a little skeptical and probably have a lot of the same thoughts that everybody else has and that, you know, we're making these huge changes to our lives and we don't really understand how far things have spread. And um, so he was really on board with testing. He was super gung ho about it. And then he brought me to his friends and was like, Hey, you guys got to get this guy to test you. And they were all super nice. And, you know, it, it's just uh, the, there's a, story there um so that is worth on another time but you know anyway they they all test it negative which is good um thankfully uh so it appears at least based off this small study that the homeless population hadn't been hit very hard yet uh I think since this time, there's been a diagnosed case or two in my county in the homeless population. But yeah, those were those re the results um, so far. Ian, so I think I'm, I'm back on. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Cool. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, did you happen to see there was a study that was published as a preprint maybe like two days ago about um, a homeless shelter in Boston where they did RT-PCR testing, I think in the third week of March, and 36% of the entire homeless population within the shelter tested positive for COVID-19? Yeah, I did see that result. And that was you know, surprising compared to what's happening here. Um, I know, you know, on the East Coast, I know there's a lot of homeless people, but you guys have 
a lot more shelters for them than, than we have on the West Coast. There's out here, we have all kinds of um, homeless encampments all over the streets and stuff. Uh, so they're not staying in shelters like they are on the East Coast. And maybe because of that difference, maybe um, having them stacked on top of each other in closer quarters, they're spreading it more rapidly between each other. Interesting. Um, I had one question about this uh, with the OD figures here. Mm -hmm. um, and then I posted this on the research hub discussion, but uh, I see the line for the negative control. Do you mind kind of describing what went into the negative control? Well, the negative control is just a blank. So that would have been testing to see how much binding there is from anti-human IgG or human anti-IgG to the um, recombinant protein that's coated on the plate, the spike recombinant protein. So it wasn't like a known negative control. You know, it wasn't serum or anything, no negative serum. So I guess you could call it a blank rather than a negative control. Yeah, I, I thought that was interesting. Do you know, like, if if you did use like a confirmed negative case of somebody, ha have you seen any data on if there would be binding in that case? Um. Well, I yes and no. I've seen data from people who are confirmed negative for like one coronavirus and uh, are test it for antibody response against other coronaviruses. And there can be some overlap. Um, and I actually linked to that paper in my report. So um, yeah, that is possible. It, it, antibodies are, can be sticky too. So, you know, you kind of expect a little bit of background binding. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, one thing I was curious about too is like um, I've seen a lot of data and I don't know the specifics about how conserved different proteins are within uh, COVID-19 compared to other coronaviruses. Do you know if the spike protein is the most unique protein to SARS-CoV-2 or if you use n the nucleocapsid I think you mentioned earlier? Is there is there one that's kind of like the most specific to what we're currently dealing with? So my understanding is that spike is the most unique to the COVID-19. Um, it's more unique than nucleocapsid. I uh, saw an article recently about that that did compare patients um, serum antibody levels to those two um, epitopes and spike is the dominant response is that yeah so um do you want me to keep going with the paper yeah that'd be awesome all right, uh, so here's our plate itself. Um, just, I, you know, it helps to visually show these things and, you know, the test itself makes it more real and sticky in people's minds than just a bar chart. Um, and I knew going into the, uh, like writing the report, that nature of kind of academic science is they're going to be skeptical of anybody who hasn't gone through, you know, what they consider to be the proper channels to do things. And so um, I wanted to be as transparent as possible, which meant showing the actual test plate and, you know, being upfront about it. Uh, and, you know, the, the color change is hard to argue with, right? Like the number 32 is clearly 
got some sort of, you know, change happening there compared to everybody else. And you, even if you, you know, have never heard of an ELISA before, or have any idea what it means, you can tell that there's something different about that one and, you know, maybe 35 and 13. So um, I thought it would kind of help with credibility a little bit as, as like a secondary data point to the OD values from above. I think it really drives the message home. I think this is definitely my favorite figure in the entire thing. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, it just makes it real. It's not made up. Totally. Um, and then, yeah, I had a questionnaire in my study, which I thought was important. And I actually, that uh, study that you're talking about that was published today out of um, Santa Clara, I thought they really left a lot on the table by not including a questionnaire. Um, because you need to provide a little bit more context to everything. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Just, just just for the people in the audience, do you mind just giving like a quick minute overview of the paper that came out today? Yeah, so today um, there is a paper. It was super highly anticipated. I swear I've been hearing about this paper for over a week. Um, but they were doing a massive serum antibody survey down in um, the Bay Area, specifically Santa Clara County. Um, and they ended up testing roughly 3,300 people for uh, IgG response to coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, and so then they published the results and there was somewhere around 4% positive test rate in their study cohort, which is, they said, you know, they have these wide confidence intervals, but somewhere between 50 and 85 times the um, uh, positive, known positive cases as reflected in like official state testing data. So their take home message was pretty similar to what I said, which is that, you know, there's people out in the community who have never been tested or diagnosed who have had coronavirus and have antibodies to that recognize, you know, COVID-19. And so that was their report. And, you know, it was really well done. Tons of samples, way higher powered than my study. Um, they had, I saw some pictures online of like cars lining up, people coming by to get tested. I think they did some Facebook advertising, which is a great way to uh, get people out and get tested. Yeah, I kind of wanted to touch on that actually, because I, I do think like, like sort of the motivation behind your study and this study is to get accurate case data of, you know, who, like what proportion of this country has actually had you know, a COVID-19 infection over the past couple of months. And so um, I, I was curious, before I cut off before, one question I had about your study, um, you described it as like a semi-random sample. Mm -hmm. uh, with this study out of Santa Clara, um, like, I, I feel like um, for, for something that, you know, has the resources, it's interesting to me that they chose to do a Facebook ad because you're almost sort of uh, selecting a certain population, you know, that you're going to test for just, you know, initially Facebook users and then people who will click on an ad and drive to a place where they can be tested. And so I'm curious when you did your test, kind of how you chose the people. And then uh, I guess like if you had unlimited resources, like how you think you would go about that? Um, you know, I'm, it, I don't want to be critical of the way that they advertise their, for their study. Um, I think without that type of advertising, they would have had far, far fewer participants. So you got to weigh those, um, 
you know, two things in your mind when you're deciding what to do. And almost any study population, <laughs> to be honest, any study population is going to be biased unless you can somehow get a uh, secret blood sample from people, you know, when they're not looking or something and just completely randomly do that. Uh, but, you know, there's always going to be some sort of bias in in uh, your pool, but you combat that by collecting a lot of samples. Um, see, I'm trying to remember your other questions. Uh, for my study, did you ask about how, uh, what did you say? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious how, how you did yours as well. And then, like, I, I wasn't trying to be critical. I think more so, like, in a, in a perfect world, because you can't really just collect people's blood either. You know, there's, like, with informed consent, you you got to do things the right way. So, I, like, if you were to have unlimited resources and set up this study, like, how, how would you go about the sampling procedure? Oh, um, so the way I did mine... It's like I bought the kit and then I was like, oh shit, I spent, I kind of spent a lot of money on this kit. I better use the whole thing up. And so I started to contact people and I had seen, um, like my fiance um, told me about some friends who posted on Facebook about being really sick. And so I contacted them to see if they want to get tested. And then, some friends had other friends who, you know, heard that, you know, they were going to get tested. So the friends of friends wanted to get tested too. So it was pretty much just people I knew and then maybe one, uh, some other person they knew. Um, if I had unlimited resources or more resources, how would I do this? Um, you know, I think social media advertising is a good one. Um, it's a good way to get a lot of samples. If you have a big enough account and credibility, uh, you could, one thing I've, I've thought about doing is, you know, just like driving around to little strip malls, set up a pop-up tent with a sign that says COVID antibody tests, research study, and see how many people stop by. Um, because, you know, it's a, a blood draw kind of sucks. Nobody really likes it, actually. Um, even even as a phlebotomist, you don't like to have your blood drawn. Um, so you got to deal with that. But a lot of, it's not that challenging to do, you know. It can be done anywhere. You don't have to have, like, a special clean room or anything like that to do it. So you could set up a tent and... Uh, lounge chair or something like that and line people up. Uh, so I, I think I'd, you know, do a combined approach of social media outreach and then going to different physical locations that might have a high traffic to capture other people. And then I think it's important to get the homeless population as well because um, they're going to be underrepresented and you want to keep an eye on what's going on there because in those populations, there's a lot of people who are unable to care for themselves or seek medical attention. And um, so you want to help look after them. I don't know if that answers your question though. No, that's, that's actually a great answer. I think like having like almost different like sources of testing, would be pretty cool where like you said like one can be a facebook ad another could be contacting your friends another could be you know a lounge chair at a strip mall um and then i think the once you get all of them together you can get a pretty interesting picture of what's actually happening um the reason i asked that is because to me the the really really interesting thing that i hope you kind of kick off here is the ability for anyone to do this in the country and so I, i'm curious like have you thought at all about other people doing this and if they do do it like 
a way for others to maybe combine their data in order to see a bigger picture? Yeah, I have been contacted by a couple of different people who wanted to mimic the study um, wherever they were located. And I just answer their questions, you know, usually they send me some sort of simple question related to the methods or which kit you use. And then I never hear from them again, <laughs> which is fine. I'm all for that, you know? Um, so in terms of, sh and then in terms of sharing data, you know, that would, that would be great. Uh, I think that is the big thing that's lacking. You know, you see these studies, um, the Santa Clara study, there was the um, uh, Germany study, you know, it's a different country, so maybe it doesn't matter as much, but I know I saw today that University of Washington Virology Lab is uh, gonna start doing the serum antibody test next week. They think they can do like up to 4,000 a day. But, you know, this is a problem in science. When I was in bioscience, is that these different things, they, the data stays siloed from each other. And a lot of times these institutions are not um, transparent about the data either. They might present a summary of the data, but they don't, you know, they're not providing you with the cross tabs with the lowest level of detailed data, you know, like even in a de-identified de way, you know, they could potentially be doing that, say at the county level. And um, so since that doesn't exist, there is, you know, an opportunity there to do that. It would be super um, helpful for people. And if others could copy the study wherever they are and then upload results, it'd be great. Because the thing is, there's gonna be massive differences in your um, positive test rate in New York compared to Wyoming, you know, or wherever else. And, you know, it's just kind of, you, there's a lot of physical limitations in getting a clear view at all these different geographies you know, within a timely period. Yeah, totally. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. And I think what you just mentioned transitions really nicely to one of the questions we have on the discussion page. And okay. sort of ties into, um, I know you follow uh, Balaji on Twitter. And he talks a lot about red zones and green zones and that concept. So uh, KJ writes, hey Ian, it was interesting to see you map out where your samples came from. Do you think this method uh, with ideally a mass application could identify geographically whether some communities are more susceptible to the virus? I was thinking it could help map out where resources are needed most in less dense, parentheses, non-city areas. Curious about your thoughts as to the end goal of your research. Yeah, I, I think you could eventually get to that point. Um, where you're able to identify the areas that have been hit harder, or maybe are more at risk. Um, there's, there, you know, when you do these things, you kind of you might look like an expert when you publish it, but then the actual act of doing it makes, uh, usually if you're doing a good job, it means that you end up with more questions than you start it with. And so, um, you know, I end, end up wondering what does it mean if somebody has a positive signal on, on this antibody test, does that actually mean they're immune or not? I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows. Um, if they're negative on this test, maybe they were positive on a nucleocapsid test, you know, and maybe that means they still have, uh, immune protection. Um, I was just talking to a friend of mine today about the potential for um, non-antibody based immunity, like a cell mediated immunity, which is, you know, highly unlikely, but, you know, in biology, there's no absolute, so that is possible. Um, so 
I guess my point is that you, you end up, it's hard to make a uh, conclusive statement about red zones or green zones or what might be possible right now, because we just don't know about, you know, the immunity that you get from having a positive result on this specific test. And, you know, what level also, how many, what, what antibody titer do you need to become immune? What situation? So you can see how it becomes difficult to make conclusions, but in terms of KJ's, uh, question about redirecting resources or guiding resources, I think, you know, that that could be a way this would be used. Um, that'd be a productive way for it to be used. Um, you don't take the, the results to be uh, definitive in any one direction. They're just kind of indicate or suggestive of something. And you use that to, you know, change your um, decision making process. And then in the future, you're going to have to reassess and maybe new information comes in and you change your mind about that decision. So. I think you bring up a really good point in that science in general is an iterative process. Mm -hmm. And so even taking the first step, to, to put this data out there and to get people thinking about how to refine the process in order to say the end goal is to be able to figure out red zones or green zones or who can go back to work or that kind of thing. Like you can't just say, hey, let's do an antibody test and figure it out. Like you have to actually figure out if the antibody test gives you the information you need to make that decision. So it's, it's a, it's a, cool 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 first step and i'm excited to to see kind of how things get refined over the next couple of months yeah i with the red zone green zone thing i in thinking back to that uh santa clara paper i was just thinking about how you know one common thing that i saw people say on twitter latch on to was that the study authors said there's potentially 50 to 85 fold more people infected than we originally thought. And so there's a certain subsection of Twitter that says, ha, huh, I, you know, see it's way more widespread than um, people thought. And it means something, but then, you know, they still only estimated about 4% of people have been exposed, which means potentially 96% of people have not been exposed yet. So there's a lot of and I think the uh, reading I've done suggests that once you hit about 70% exposure is when herd immunity um, is strong enough to put the negative pressure on that virus or infectious disease. So, you know, it's this is not indicative of herd immunity. There, it's a long way from that. So. Yeah, absolutely. So we have one question left on the, the research uh, hub discussion page. And if anybody in the crowd has a question, you know, feel free to type it in the chat here. So I'll bring that one up. Um, it starts off with a quote uh, from your paper, basically citing the study that says like a antibody or an IgG positive result here doesn't like 100% indicate that it's SARS-CoV-2. It could be, you know, another coronavirus that is similar enough where you were exposed previously and now have antibodies to that. And so uh, Sarah Langben says, hello, thank you for sharing. It's inspiring to see your individual effort and see the community pull together to learn more about this. I have two questions. Do you think the effect, or do you think this effect will be taken advantage of? And can someone artificially develop these antibodies without having a past infection? So I think what she's trying to get at here is like, if you can get antibodies to um, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein from a prior coronavirus infection, can you use another coronavirus to potentially vaccinate people? Does that immunity apply to uh, SARS-CoV-2 or is there 
I guess, a, a way to bring about this immune response without necessarily exposing someone to COVID-19? Um, yeah, so one, one answer is, yes, you can use antibody therapy, and that is being developed right now. And we're going to soon be hearing about it. Um, you know, I haven't watched much of uh, the news or the, like the presidential press conferences and stuff like that um, about related to coronavirus or COVID-19 um, because I've been so busy working on this stuff. But one that I did watch was it was like the very first press conference and it was Trump with a bunch of the biotech executives. And they if you go back to that one you'll see or hear them talk about this timeline for getting new treatments out. And they say in a couple months, we'll have antibody therapy. And then, you know, hopefully at in a year, we'll have a vaccine or something like that. Well, the antibody therapy they're talking about is uh, basically synthetic antibodies or um, bioengineered antibodies. They're produced in things called hybridomas and you can, make them in bioreactors and create them at scale. And uh, it, it's basically like one of these antibodies from an individual, but just created in a lab. Uh, those are actually how Ebola virus ended up being treated is through uh, antibody therapy. Um, so yeah, it is possible. Um, the And then in terms of uh, protection from other coronaviruses. Yeah. The, it, like if you had an antibody from another, ex, from exposure to another coronavirus and it tests positive on this test, then that indicates that that in a, antibody, even though it um, came about because you had a different coronavirus, the antibody is still recognizing the, this protein that is specific to COVID-19 and so you would um, assume there's going to be some immune protection in uh, that situation. And that's just one of those other things, too, that needs to be studied a little bit more to figure out how much protection is there and what does it actually mean. Um, and then uh, the other thing is, you know, there's a whole treatment called convalescent serum therapy where you are able to take the serum from somebody who got COVID-19 and recovered and they made their body started producing antibodies to COVID-19 and you can take that person's blood and isolate the serum and inject it into somebody who's really sick and that person who is sick might get better and it's actually really effective. It's one of the most effective um, pre-existing therapies that's out there um and it convalescent serum therapy is really interesting it, the 1901 nobel prize was actually awarded for the discovery of th that type of therapy um there is a guy who ended a diphtheria epidemic in germany in the late 1890s by using um actually used horse serum. They would give horses uh, repeated doses of diphtheria to get their antibody tighter up and then take the serum and give it to sick people. And so he saved, you know, a lot of people's lives in the 1890s doing that and uh, got the Nobel Prize for it. And then uh, you see almost every epidemic uh, where somebody's used convalescent serum therapy and had great results and then it just kind of gets um, discarded until the next time and people use, they try everything else and everything else kind of fails because it's a new virus or something and they go back to convalescent serum therapy and what do you know, it works. And so. Do you think like one of the silver linings of this situation is you have a bunch of really smart people who are kind of locked in their rooms and they're coming up with like incredibly creative solutions on how to help, you know, society in general get over this. 
We have uh, one question here from Rob Stevenson in the chat. He says, uh, thanks for taking the time. And what was the cost of the collecting tubes and the kit? The kit is 550 bucks. In the tubes themselves, I eat, no, I don't know the individual cost, but you would need um, a vacutainer, uh, a blood tube. Actually, I have some over here I could show you on my screen if you want to see. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay, one second. <laughs> Okay, can you see? Yeah, perfect. So this is the type of tube I used, which is, um, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see the label. You have to let me know. Yeah, we can see it pretty well. Yeah, so uh, just SST tube. It has this gel in it. And so what that does, you centrifuge and the blood cells go to the bottom, then you'll have the layer of gel and then at the top will be the serum and you just take the serum layer off for your test. And then um, the other thing I use is this um, blood collector needle thing, adapter. Um, has a little tube, take it out. Now it won't be sterile. Well, uh, so you have this tube. These are probably like a buck. I'd say each is probably a buck. Then you have alcohol uh, wipes and some gauze and some tape and some uh, tourniquets. So that's all you need. Can't buy anything individually. It's probably like a hundred bucks per pack of a hundred or so. So uh, anyway, you need these. Um, needle right here under that protector and you just um, insert the needle, put the tube in. There's a little syringe in here, goes in the top of the tube. There's a vacuum inside this tube, inside this tube. So then the blood will just, you know, flow in there because um, uh, high pressure, low pressure. And then, um, you uh, just pull it out and then you have your blood sample in there. So uh, per person, the cost is actually really cheap. I don't know what that flushes out to. If you do 40 people, $550 for the kit, then say $5 in supplies for every other, per for every person, probably looking at like $30 true just cost of supplies does that answer your question rob i tend to be really long-winded when i answer questions yeah, right. that's awesome. that was it's it's great to see the actual supplies it's not something to really think about like the the practicality of actually drawing blood there's a lot of stuff involved yeah it's it's not that technical so it is really easy to do um you could probably do it with about a uh 20 minutes of training it just takes a little bit of practice when you start to get into people who have who are tough draws. So we're just at about an hour now and I have a uh, kind of two last questions. Uh, the first one is kind of building off the, what you needed to have in order to do this study. I noticed that like, uh, like to read the plates, you said you had a plate reader, and then a centrifuge and a negative 20 freezer. So mm -hmm. like, uh, I assume you like have access to a lab somewhere. Do you know if, if somebody wanted to recreate this, is that something you, where they could, like, do you have any recommendations on what people could do to like find a centrifuge in their own community? Yeah. Uh, so a centrifuge in your own community, there are, I see, Depends on how biohacker you want to be with it. Uh, there's some used lab equipment websites out there. You could probably find a centrifuge. 
that you can buy for relatively cheap. Uh, you you know you just want to make sure that the centrifuge will hold the tubes that you buy, and you're going to probably want to get these tubes if you're doing phlebotomy. Um, then everything else, you know, or the plate reader would be expensive. You the best bet would be to find an established lab that has the equipment um, and piggyback off them if you can. Uh, but other than that, you can see from, I don't know if my screen's still up or whatnot. I can pull it up, hold on one second. Okay. Uh, oh, you don't have to, you don't have to, but you can see on the, the test plate that you get this color change. And so oh, sometimes because of the color change, you can qualitatively evaluate the test. And so you don't need a plate reader to see that number 32 is positive and 35. Some of them, it gets wishy-washy, you know, like number six, who is a positive is pretty close to, you know, say number 11. And it's only with the plate reader that I could tease that out. But the thing is, um, they should be retested anyways. So point being, you could actually do this whole thing without any um, hardware, but you don't have to actually centrifuge the blood. You could just let the blood clot and then um, just pipe. Serum is just the liquid portion of blood. So you could let the blood clot and then all the cells and everything um, kind of get balled up in, in that, and then you'll have the liquid portion that's free, and you'll pipette that off or take it off and add it to an, the plate. Dilute it first, obviously. So, so in the minus, minus 20 freezer is really, your, your freezer's at minus 20 degrees Celsius at home. Cool. It's in the range. Yeah, and the other thing I was thinking too is like if you didn't have access to a plate reader, I'm sure if you had like a iPhone camera, there are plenty of programs online that can kind of like I guess distinguish very small changes in color that you could use as like a, a home solution. Yeah, I actually was thinking about doing that, uh, doing uh, pixel or like quantifying pixelation or pixels in each well. Um, but in which I would have probably ended up doing if I didn't use the play reader. Yeah, very cool. So I have uh, one last question. Um, and like, thank you so much for doing this. I think this is a, you know, a really cool thing. And I'm glad that you took the time to, you know, share your story and how you were able to conduct it with everybody. Um, what do you have plans for? Are you going to expand the study? Are you going to do something next? Like what's, what's the next step? Yeah, I've been trying. Um, so I got CureHub kind of rebooted and am going to redirect that to doing the serum antibody testing. Um, I've been trying, <laughs> got to get an IRB to scale it up. IRB is internal review board, uh, which is needed for human research. Um, at scale and so I've been looking into that and uh, it's a very tedious process full of bureaucratic red tape time consuming uh, so yeah it, it, it's a challenge I'm working through trying to get the IRB and actively looking for collaborators that maybe have an existing um, setup that I could uh, use. Um, you know, like existing lab equipment, lab space, because, you know, I don't have any of that for myself. This is a side project. <laughs> I, I wasn't able to redirect any lab sort uh, resources towards this. That's a pretty awesome side project. <laughs> you know, thanks. 
Cool. Well, if anybody, if you have any more questions, you know, put them in the chat. I guess, uh, um, Ian, is there anything else you'd, you'd like to say to kind of sign off? I think, uh, you know, again, I'm super grateful that you took the time to do this. I, I think it's inspiring. And I hope others kind of take your lead and share their data in a similar way that you did. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, first, just thanks for having me on. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to share you know the work I did and um, just getting it out there to the public is uh, beneficial and you know that's all I can ask for is a chance to kind of be heard and it's hard sometimes um, without my own platform without an existing platform to do that so I'm very grateful for the opportunity um, in terms of other people, I think that uh, if you're here, you probably have a uh, strong desire to uh, strong like DIY um, own about you, and I think you should embrace that and you know constantly uh, push push the boundaries. And sometimes you gotta just go for things and um, you know not not think about all the reasons why you shouldn't or can't do it um, because sometimes the situation calls for uh, just pushing pushing ahead forging the path and um, take the risks it might be worth it I don't know so I hopefully that helped you yeah, no, that's awesome. I mean, I said in the tweet, but I really think you're leading by example. So uh, j just so everybody knows, too, this call is recorded, and uh, we're going to end up putting it on our YouTube channel under a Creative Commons license. So Ian, if you want to you know, use this any way you want to, feel free, and anybody else in the audience should as well. So I think uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. You know, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Ian, for taking the time to speak with us. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing where things go. So you yeah, know, I was gonna say, Rob in a comment said, um, "Are you, a Rob? Are you asking if I need help with an IRB?" Because, yeah, definitely need help. I've, all day I've been working on it, or I've been, you know, thinking about it, and it's like, man, at my old institution we had a whole compliance department and teams of people that did all this. It's a nightmare. And maybe, do you mind saying how, if people are watching this video, how they could get in contact with you if they wanted to collaborate or help out in some way? Oh, yeah. Um, you could find me on Twitter and reach out to me there, which is, I'm at Ian Felipe says, um, or you could email me, and my email is Hilgart, I, H I L G A R T I, at gmail.com. Awesome, sweet. And thank yeah, you. just reach out to me either way. Yeah, very nice. Well, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, you know, we really appreciate it. And then looking forward to the next time. Yeah, thank you, Patrick. And thanks everybody for uh, sticking around.